to provide a little bit of context before we get into the talk proper, um, I basically created the, this set of slides uh, really aimed at the public audience. Okay, and uh, the, the objective really is to foster a bit of a better understanding about suicide and also to provide some general pointers on helping people who are at risk, who may be at risk of, of suicide. So I don't think I'll be going into a lot of specifics or technicality. Sometimes when we do this talk or teach this in, in hospitals or you know to healthcare staff, we tend to go very technical, but I'm trying to avoid that as much as possible. Of course, uh, if there's any areas that you would like me to elaborate on or delve into a little bit deeper, please um, submit your questions and I'll do my best to take them uh, as, as we go along or after the talk. And uh, for further assistance, of course, I've prepared some uh, additional support uh, resources uh, at the end of the talk. All right, so why are we talking about suicide? I'm sure most of you would have already, you know, uh, noticed or, or it's hit the news recently that, that, you know, suicide rates have been going up. Um, and basically why, why suddenly did this news pop up? Okay, just to give you an idea, actually, uh, Numbers, suicide numbers in Singapore is tracked mainly by the organization SOS, Samaritans of Singapore. And annually, what they do is actually in July, they will publish the annual report and report on the numbers of the pre previous year's uh, suicide. Okay, so every July, they put out the report and therefore, you know, it hits the news and the numbers are then reviewed, you know, in the, talked about in the press. And it's been, you know, uh, talked about uh, in various ways, but as you can see here from the headlines, you know, uh, alarmingly, uh, suicide among the elderly has hit uh, quite a high uh, rate, you know, last year. But really, what does this number, what do all these numbers mean? So I want to put it into a little bit of a context for you. And I did a little bit of digging. Basically, these are the numbers that SOS has uh, reported over the years. And if you look at it, actually, yes, we are hitting a bit of a high in uh, last year, 2020. And it's been a high over the last uh, five years, but it's not really the highest it's been. So it kind of fluctuates uh, over the years. And you know, we can discuss a little bit about factors and all these things, but actually, you know, what, what contributes to, to suicide numbers, you know, is really up to anyone's guess. And, and people have been looking into a lot of these uh, factors. All right. So 2017 was a bit lower numbers, and we've been climbing over the last few years. Uh, on top of that, you know, uh, when we talk about suicide. What are some other interesting statistics? So basically why uh, elderly suicides uh, have been in the press recently is because last year, out of the 452, 154 cases were among seniors aged, more, uh, aged over, above 60. And this is really the highest number that's ever been recorded since SOS started tracking suicide numbers in 1991. Okay, so that 1991 was the first year when um, suicide numbers were reported and uh, among seniors, this has risen to a high of 154 cases last year. Um, suicide in general, okay, in general, is known to be a leading cause of death among those aged between 10 to 29. Okay, this age group is when people are generally healthy. They don't really uh, die from illness, you know, or old age. Um, so uh, suicide is a, one of the leading, it's not the top leading cause, it's still one of the causes of death for those in the younger age group. And traditionally, you know, across different countries, across different cultures, suicide rates generally trend higher among our teens, uh, the younger population, and among the elderly. Okay, generally there are two peaks among the younger and the elder, uh, older populations. And if you look at the number of uh, total number of suicide deaths, men tend to account for more completed suicides than women. Okay, so traditionally, when we talk about suicide, men tend to die from suicides more than women. But when we look at attempted suicides, you know, number of people who have attempted suicides before, women tend to outnumber men. All right, and in Singapore now, the the means of uh, suicide uh, actually vary very interestingly across different cultures across countries okay and unfortunately singapore being a cosmopolitan city you know lots of high-rise buildings and all that falls from heights 
uh, tend to be the most common cause of death by suicide in Singapore. Okay, and finally, um, this is a very rough number, but for every suicide, estimates are that there are at least six other people who survive suicide or survive suicide attempts, all right? And, and so there are a lot more uh, attempt, people who attempt suicide than completed suicides. Actually, um, this number is vague because actually a lot of attempted suicides uh, go unreported or undetected. All right, so um, sometimes the numbers are a bit harder to ascertain as to how many people have attempted suicide before. Um, all right. Okay, so when we talk about suicide, what do I mean? Okay, some definitions about the terms. Um, when we say suicide or completed suicide, what I mean is where people harm themselves with the goal of actually ending their life and they actually die as a result of that. Versus, versus where we say a suicide attempt or attempted suicide is when people harm themselves with still with the goal of ending their life, but they don't actually die. They actually survive the attempt. So we, call, we term that as a suicide attempt. We do, um, in terms of mental health care, we do make a small differentiation between suicide, attempted suicide, and what we call deliberate self-harm. Deliberate self-harm essentially means an intentional act of causing physical injury to oneself, but without actually wanting to die, without the goal or the intention of ending their life. And this is slightly a uh, different uh, uh, entity um, very commonly, what uh, we see as uh, deliberate self-harm really is commonly things like cutting themselves. Um, and it's not necessarily a suicide attempt, okay? So this one, I won't cover too much in detail, but if you have questions, we can, we can discuss that a little bit more in detail later. All right. Well, the first thing I think I want to uh, uh, emphasize when we are trying to understand suicide is really that suicidal behavior is, is complex. Okay, that's the first thing that we really need to recognize. There is no really one single cause as to uh, why people develop suicide behavior, suicidal behavior or they go on to, to attempt suicide. What we do know is that mental illness does constitute a very significant contributing factor. Okay, uh, up to 90%, some people estimate even 95% of people who actually die by suicide may have a diagnosable mental disorder. Okay, why they say may have a diagnosable disorder? Because actually a large number of people actually are undiagnosed. So the people who actually have diagnosed suicide may not be as high as 90%, but the estimates are that actually most people who go on to uh, attempt or complete suicide actually do have a diagnosable mental disorder and including but not uh, not uh, exhaustively uh, depression, anxiety, you know, psychosis, things like schizophrenia, delusions, uh, including substance use disorder, alcoholism or other uh, drug related uh, disorders or personality disorders as well. So these are examples of the conditions that people have that can lead them you know, to develop suicidal behavior. But if we look at suicidal behavior as a whole, actually, uh, because it's so complex, it really, the, the reasons why people become suicidal really spans the, the breadth and, uh, of all the factors uh, that make up our, you know, our personhood, really our self, biological factors like uh, illness, you know, physical health, uh, medications that you may be on, uh, genetics also, psychological factors, you know, like what we said, personality, uh, uh, their, their psychological makeup, as well as social factors, you know, their, their background, social economic status and things like that. So really, the factors are very uh, wide, uh, very uh, uh, huge diversity in, 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 in factors leading to suicide. So very hard for us to pinpoint exactly why uh, there's been an uptick or, or, or why people develop suicidal behavior. But we do know studies on people who have attempted or completed suicide before, ha we have studied what are some of the factors uh, that kind of uh, characteristics of people who actually uh, complete suicide, what, what are the more characteristics that these people have? 
So we term this as risk factors, okay? Who are, tends to be more at risk of suicide? And these are factors that uh, kind of uh, help us identify of uh, people who are more at risk. And this actually, uh, this list is a long list. Actually, it's not exhaustive also. I just put a bit of a, a example here. But the clearest and the strongest risk factor for people uh, who may uh, tend to complete suicide is really this first one, a history of suicide attempts. So people who have tried to uh, harm themselves or end their lives before are at the highest risk at of actually attempting again or eventually completing suicide. This is the one thing that we are taught to look out for the most. The rest really not so much in order, but they're just characteristics. So like I said before, among our younger population, as well as um, the elderly, they tend to, uh, uh, suicide rates tend to be higher. We do know non-religious people who have no faith background also, uh, the risk of, it, it, is also a risk factor for, for suicide. Social isolation and loneliness, definitely this is one of the key factors that uh, probably uh, may be a big contributing factor to why elderly suicides have uh, risen in the last year. So classically speaking, when we talk about social isolation and loneliness, uh, one of the other factors that we do know is that suicide rates tend to be uh, higher among singles, people who are single, or people who have been divorced rather than people who are married. Okay, so these are, these are simply characteristics. They're not indications to say, oh, if you're single, you have a higher risk. They're just simply characteristics for us to pick up, you know, uh, risk factors in, in, in individual people that we, uh, we see and we try to help. Of course, like I said, uh, mood disorders like depression, personality disorders, substance misuse disorders. Uh, these are, are things that are, are significant risk factors as well. Uh, family history of suicide as well. Uh, you know, a bit of uh, genetic factors sometimes. Um, terminal illness or chronic pain because people are struggling with uh, significant physical health issues or chronic pain issues. This can be a significant risk factor as well or people who have undergone recent loss or stressful life event, including things like um, you know, uh, legal prosecution, for example, uh, uh, divorce, uh, things like that can constitute a, a temporary transient risk factor that, that increases risk. Okay, so on the flip side, we don't just look at risk factors. Now, everybody is a complex mix of different contributing factors, right? Because so essentially there are other, on the other side of things, there are also what we call protective factors. Where we, when we talk to people, when we assess people, we want to know, okay, what are some positive uh, factors that actually may be holding them back or preventing them from, uh, you know, going on to actually uh, harm themselves. Um, one, uh, Good example is strong social connections and support. People who are connected uh, with other people tend to have better ways of dealing with stress. Um, people who are forward-looking still, having future goals, things that they are looking forward to, uh, or what we call being future-oriented, also indicates that they, there's something that still you know, they can look forward to, so they may not go on to attempt to harm themselves. People generally who have good coping and problem solving skills may mean that they're more resilient and not so reactive to stress. People with positive values and beliefs, okay, uh, tend to have something that also helps them and also an ability and willingness to seek and access help. So, so these are factors that sometimes can be protective and some things that we do look out for. Okay, so I'm going to share with you um, the, the bulk of, you know, the rest of my slides. Really, I'll share with you some tips on, let's say, if you were someone who, you know, was uh, helping a person who is struggling with uh, mental health issues or emotional issues, or you do encounter someone who may be uh, expressing suicidal thoughts or you are worried for them. What are some tips, okay, that, that some st easy steps that you can follow um, break it down a little bit in, in terms of how to help people. Okay, so really tip number one, suicide prevention tip number one, is really how do we notice the, the warning signs or notice what uh, are some risky behaviors or signs that may 
hint to us that someone needs help, okay? So what the, the, the signs of really uh, someone who may be having suicidal thoughts is of course clearly someone who talk, uh, frequently or, or starts to talk about death or suicide a little bit more. They may be expressing, the clearer sign is expressing suicidal thoughts or thoughts of not wanting to live anymore. Now, the next two are especially important as well. They may start making comments not directly about death or, or hurting themselves, but really about the idea that they feel very hopeless or they feel that uh, they feel very helpless, very stuck or worthless, you know, um, as also having no reason or meaning in life and no sense of purpose in life. So um, hopelessness, helplessness, uh, meaninglessness, uh, sense of purpose, these are uh, strong hints actually that people are kind of at the end of their rope. You see, when when someone don't have doesn't have any more meaning, they don't feel there's meaning, there's no purpose, there's no reason to go on. That really is is um, it, it kind of marks the next step in terms of developing. You know, having more stronger and stronger thoughts of uh, hurting themselves. Of course, other signs include gathering the means of actually doing something to hurt themselves. This could be. Uh, take for example, uh, accumulating pills. If people are starting to gather pills. Um, if people are starting to you know uh, 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 do things like you, you you know some some people are thinking of hanging themselves. They may prepare the rope and things like that. Okay, so um, preparing little means we we want to know whether they are get they are getting prepared. They may start withdrawing from other people. They may no longer. Uh, People who used to, to meet up regularly, they may decide not to, they don't want to other people to notice their behavior and things like that. So they end up more socially withdrawn. And especially this last one, preparing last acts, you know, doing up their will. Um, they may be saying goodbye or they may, you know, be leaving plans. Uh, they may be writing a final note, for example. These are things that we are especially want to be on the lookout for that may hint that, you know, they may be preparing themselves to take a uh, next step. Okay, so first step is really notice, uh, pick up. Now, step two, tip number two, really is to check in with them. Okay, so once you notice that someone may, you, that there's reason to be concerned, you want to uh, kind of check in with them, uh, find out how they are doing. All right, so essentially it's about starting a conversation. Why is this important? Because checking in uh, uh, really helps by giving the, these people an opportunity to express their feelings. Very often people feel partly because of stigma, partly also because you know, the, the negative emotions kind of uh, make them feel very helpless. They may feel very stuck. They may feel um, that uh, things are very bleak and there's actually they don't deserve help or that they don't uh, there's no way to help them that there's they, they feel very helpless so really this checking in process and starting a conversation is the first step to encourage them and give them an opportunity to express their feelings this by doing so actually just by this step alone you can actually provide relief from you know loneliness or pent up negative feelings and may very well be a, a, a simple way of preventing actually someone from going on to, to attempting suicide. The one thing that I want to impress and the first thing that we actually teach um, people in the helping professions is that really asking people about suicidal thoughts does not make a person suicidal, it does not plant the seeds of uh, suicide in people you are talking to. Okay, so don't generally be afraid of talking about it. You can't uh, trigger uh, suicidal thoughts in a person just by asking about it. But at the same time, I want to um, really recognize that actually helping people uh, with suicidal thoughts or who have a lot of negative feelings does take a lot of courage. It does take a lot of effort and energy. So that's one thing to be uh, aware of. I'm, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do, but really don't be afraid if you uh, feel that you need to ask about it. So as part of this uh, tip, tip number two on checking in, how can we actually start some conversations? I want to give you some easy uh, ways of starting conversations because we're not, you know, naturally uh, trained or geared to talking a lot about these things. Sometimes they can be very sensitive. So what are some easy conversation starters? Really is asking 
you know, how are you doing? You know, I, I noticed you've been quiet lately. I noticed you've been turning down, you know, our, our gatherings uh, lately. How are you doing? So I really put this in bold because essentially this, whatever the lead in, you're actually asking, you want to check in and ask how the person is doing. And really the part of doing this is, you know, being sincere, not really, you know, we are so um, socially trained to reply to this, how are you doing? You know, oh, I'm okay. You know, so we are very socially cued to answering this with a, a formality, you know, a, as a routine. But really, when you are picking up and you're, when you're concerned about people and you want to ask this, really find the right opportunity, yeah, and, and ask this really intentionally, you know, uh, authentically mean what, what you are asking, you know, and, and express your concern. I've been concerned about you because, you know, you, you, you appear tired a lot of the time, you know, you, you don't seem to be as interested as you used to be. Uh, express your concern. And when they do open up to you, hopefully if you, by, by doing this, uh, you know, conversation starter, if they do open up to you, you can continue, you know, uh, don't get stuck, you know, and don't know how to proceed with the conversation. Just, you know, gently thank them. Thank you for telling me, you know, it's, it's difficult to open up about these things. Can you tell me a bit more? Invite them, open up the opportunity for them to continue the conversation. What has been troubling you? So ask them to tell you about a bit more about how they've been feeling, um, what has been troubling you. And as they gradually open up, uh, depending if you start really getting concerned, you know, or they really start talking about uh, uh, you know, uh, having very negative thoughts, you may want to ask uh, something like, have you, ha have things gotten so bad or do you feel, have, have, has your emotions gotten so bad that you feel that you cannot go on anymore? So that's an easy way to lead into the, the conversation of asking, you know, about, about suicidal thoughts. Um, have, you, have you felt so bad that you feel you cannot go on anymore? Or have you had thoughts of hurting yourself or ending your life? So directly asking, sometimes there's no way around it. Sometimes they are skirting the issue. You just want to really, you know, uh, be clear and ask them whether they, they have been having such thoughts or not. So that's a, these are some easy conversation starters that you can, you know, uh, start with. But as, as the conversation goes on, I think I want to also give some tips and, and, uh, 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 guidance into actually when you're holding a conversation like that, how do you conduct and talk to someone who really, uh, when it's a difficult topic like that, essentially what you want to do is you're creating a safe space for people to talk to you, okay? Some do's and don'ts, basically you want really to be sincere, you want to be yourself, you want to be authentic, you want to be intentional about it, you also need to be non-judgmental because they may be talking about things that are very difficult to them, but in your perspective, you know, you're not sure whether it's really something, you know, you may not see it in the same degree of severity or it may not mean the same thing to you, but really what they are expressing is things that are important to them. So we do need to take a very non-judgmental approach. We don't want to, uh, uh, yeah, just take a non-judgmental approach and I want to stress this point that when holding a conversation like that, you should be doing more listening than responding. So the aim of the conversation, like I said in the earlier slide, right, is giving them an opportunity to express themselves. So you want to be a good listener. You're aiming to listen, to understand them, understand things from their perspective, what they are experiencing, and you're not listening in order to respond, okay? And this offer hope and reassurance then late, comes a bit later. After you are sure or you reasonably kind of understood everything that's happening, you do want to uh, offer them a little bit of hope and reassurance. The easiest way is to it by, by expressing how much you care for them, right? How much what they have said to you means to you and how much you care for them that their well-being, their life actually matters to you. One thing I want to caution here is when we, when, often when we, offer reassurance, we tend to, um, the, the, I want to uh, encourage people to, to resist offering uh, false reassurance. I'm sure things will get better or, you know, I'm sure things will work out. Sometimes we don't really know that, right? We don't really know how things will happen uh, or, or, or 
whether their problems can be solved. So don't offer false reassurance, but just impress how much you, your, your concern for them, you know, and, and uh, assure them that help is available. So if you want to learn a little bit more about listening skills, um, this is a good website that I found about what we call active listening. There are a few steps that you can follow that I feel very good uh, if you practice this. Actually, you practice this in your everyday life. In any situation, active listening is a very important skill to ensure that we are uh, 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 understanding what people are saying to us very much cl more clearly, right? It's good communication skills. What you should not do, okay, when someone approaches you or talks about their negative uh, thoughts or emotions, don't try not to appear shocked or surprised. Now, this will take a little bit of practice, and and sometimes even you know, as as professionals, uh, where we when we uh, uh, deal with patients and they tell us things in, in the middle of a consultation, it takes a little bit of practice and training not to appear shocked or surprised. We try to be as uh, neutral as possible, be as to to be as calm as possible, so that you know it, it invites them to to say a little bit more. Of course, don't argue with them. Don't belittle or dismiss you know their concerns. If they are telling you things that are important to them from their perspective, no matter what you know you, thoughts you may have, how insignificant you may think their issues are, uh, appreciate what they are saying and attend to them. You know intentionally. One thing to, to resist a lot is that uh, when people tell us about their problems and they tell us that uh, they're having issues with these things, we tend to want to help by fixing or problem solving, solving their problems for them. Now, that's not the, that should not be your first uh, kind of first reaction. Like what I said, our first reaction really is to listen, to understand, provide that opportunity for them to talk. Sometimes, sometimes you may be in a position to offer a little bit of help, offer a little bit of advice, especially if they ask you for it. If they do ask you for advice, if they do ask you uh, for help or, or you know, pro uh, some ways of solving the problem, yes, by all means, uh, appropriately share, um, but don't uh, dictate, don't prescribe, you know, you're not there to fix their problems. And very often, actually, you can't fix for someone's, for, who, for someone who is feeling suicidal, very often actually you can't fix or solve their problems. So, so try not to you know, jump to that step uh, immediately. And one thing is uh, that is sometimes also quite difficult in, in helping people is that they, they open up to you um, in confidence, yes, but at the same time, uh, uh, there's no need to uh, give them a blanket promise that you will keep things confidential. I will cover this a little bit more uh, as you go along because in tip number four later when I'll come to it is how do we ensure that as uh, people who are helping others, we want to um, have healthy boundaries ourselves and we know what to do when we are uh, helping someone who's suicidal. So one thing is that uh, yes, we keep the details of their what they tell us confidential, but you're not alone in, in helping them deal with their suicidal thoughts, okay? So this one thing, promise confidentiality, doesn't mean that uh, if they tell you that they are suicidal, you really must keep everything to yourself. Okay, tip number three is how do we uh, respond, okay? How do we react uh, and what do we do after they have started talking to you? and uh, sharing with you their suicidal thoughts or their problems. Again, I want to stress, there's no need to help someone, help this person all on your own. They may open up to you in confidence and you will want to keep some most of those details to yourself. Um, but again, it, suicidal thoughts or, or, or risk of suicide is not something that as lay people, you would want to deal with on your own, okay? The one thing to know is that if an act of self-harm is imminent, that means the person is in the, in the process or really you can't stop the person safely, the, the right thing to do, the only thing to do is really to contact emergency services, which means calling 995 or 999. Either you know uh, ambulance services or the police will be able to assist you if the act is imminent, if the person is in the midst of it or is just about to do it and you cannot safely stop the person. If the risk is high but not imminent, that means, you know, person is okay, um, you're with the person especially, then 
all you may need to do is just remain with the person. Don't leave the person alone. Uh, remove dangerous implements or the means uh, of them hurting themselves. And you will want to call for help also because again, you cannot deal with it on your own and ostensibly you won't be able to um, stay with the person, you know, all the time forever and ever, right? So you will need to eventually enlist help. Uh, of course, in this process, you will need to exercise your judgment. You will need to also uh, communicate with the person, ask them to open up and share with you uh, and, and talk them through uh, the process, okay? But help is available. Before I want to talk about uh, what kind of help is available, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of risk and risk assessment. Okay, when we talk about uh, imminent self-harm or, self, or risk, a uh, high risk of self-harm, what, what do we really mean? Because su assessing suicide risk is something that uh, mental health professionals, counselors, social workers are all kind of trained to do. Uh, I want to give you a, a little bit of a glimpse into this process, just so that you understand a little bit more, not expecting you to actually do anything of any such assessment on your own, but really to give you a, a slightly more understanding of what we mean by, you know, high risk, low risk, you know, and, and how do we ascertain that. Um, what really happens, you know, in, a, uh, in the mind of a suicidal person is that uh, thoughts actually don't immediately jump to this uh, the suicide act immediately. Actually, if you poll people just off the street uh, in general population, and if you ask yourself, uh, have, have you ever had a thought of suicide before, a thought of harming yourself before? Most people will actually tell you that they have had such thoughts before. But most people, as we know, don't actually proceed to, to harming themselves, right? Why that is so is because actually there are a few steps in between, between having actually suicidal thoughts and then eventually acting on it. It's not a, a straight jump. People usually, there are a few stages that people go through. And these stages are when we, we first, what we first entertain as thoughts, eventually develop into a plan. And when we have a plan coupled with the intention of actually dying or, or, or harming ourselves, then it culminates or ends up in the act. Okay, so when we are assessing risk, we're actually access, assessing people, where are they at the various stages of, of this uh, progression? When we talk about thoughts first, when we, we are asking people, okay, you know, how frequent have these thoughts been? And how intense has have the, have the thoughts been? Are the thoughts really strong or they just come once in a while? And also when we talk about thoughts, right, we differentiate into two types of suicidal thoughts. The first kind, uh, usually people start with more passive suicidal thoughts. These are thoughts where they may just have thoughts about death. They may wish that they were dead or they didn't exist. They, uh, and a good example of that was that I wish that I won't wake up, you know, after going to sleep. Or I wish that I would be involved in an accident and, and pass away from it. So these are passive thoughts. They're not actually wanting to do anything, but they wish that they didn't, they were not alive. Versus active suicidal thoughts is when they're actually thinking of doing, actually acting on it or doing something to, to, to harm themselves or to end their life. So uh, when we talk about thoughts, frequency, intensity, uh, the content, that means is it passive type of thought or active type of thought? And when we talk about plans, uh, we ask them, you know, have you uh, thought about how you will uh, 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 end your life? Or have you thought about actually doing anything? Which means, have they thought about how they will do it? Whether there's a date and a time that they have uh, specified, okay? Um, sometimes people will tell you this. And finally, uh, the last step before the act is really about intention, okay? In my view, a lot of times when I do the suicide risk assessment, I see the intention as the last resort because people sometimes have thoughts and they develop a plan. But when you ask them, actually, do you really want to die? They'll, tell, they'll actually honestly tell you, no, actually, I don't really want to die. I actually need help or I actually just want this pain to stop. Okay, so the intention is usually the last step. And that then... Uh, with all three in place, then uh, act is, uh, you know, a person is very, at a very high risk of an act. So I found this good table, it's a bit lengthy, uh, just to give you an idea of how do we categorize risk, right? After we've asked all these 
uh, we do sort it kind of into different degrees. And I, I, I took this table from this very helpful uh, website called helpguide.org. Um, and basically each tier basically has some characteristics. So if, if the risk is low, it means that you know we there are some thoughts, but they're mostly passive suicidal thoughts. There's no plan and there's no intention. Okay, versus a moderate, the suicide thoughts actually becoming more frequent, uh, maybe more active. There may be a vague plan, but maybe the means are not very lethal, and there's actually no intense still. So we may say that's moderate. Then versus high, high or severe, we are venturing into areas where act, the thoughts are active, suicidal thoughts, very frequent, very intense. There is a clear plan, a high degree of lethality. Um, and they may say that they actually will act on it. Okay, so high versus severe, usually we just say high. Lah. Okay, that's when you really need to do something about it. So that's just a, a rough idea of how we uh, assess suicide risk. Okay, so um, like I said, if the risk is high, remain with the person, you know, remove the dangerous implements or the means of her harming themselves and call for help. All right. If the risk is not that high, they are telling you, yeah, I've been having suicidal thoughts, but I'm not actually acting on it. I've not planned anything out. I know I've not left the last note or done anything like that. Then really you, you want to say, okay, you know, um, I would like to help. Can we draw up some uh, 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 plan to keep you safe? Let's, let's draw up some, uh, what we call a safety plan. What a safety plan is essentially is some um, concrete steps to take that can help the person keep themselves safe or uh, some practical steps on what to do if they were to develop uh, suicidal thoughts. An example, it would be identifying certain triggers, uh, clear triggers, and what to do if they encountered those triggers. Um, um, sometimes we help uh, people who are suicidal plan out, okay, when you're having a suicidal thought, what are some ways you can divert your um, attention to something else, right? Uh, and try to express those thoughts, uh, negative feelings in a different way, rather than in a kind of uh, venture down the, you know, ruminating about the suicidal thoughts. The safety plan also includes uh, providing resources, which means it, can, it, it uh, they would need to enlist the help of people who are able to deal with those suicidal thoughts. For example, uh, counselors calling a hotline, for example, or getting in touch with their healthcare provider, their mental health provider, um, and drawing up this plan. So basically they have a kind of a, a plan of what to do if they were feeling suicidal. Um, uh, if the again, if the risk is low, then basically you you want to put them in touch with connect them, connect them with um, the help that's available, reassure that there is available help, and help does uh, uh, generally these uh, resources or or care can help them feel better. And you may, depending on your role, depending on what you're able to do, uh, offer to accompany them to seek help. Now the first step to seeking help for these uh, problems, emotional problems can be very scary. Uh, there can be a lot of apprehension and hesitance involved. So sometimes your support, you know, and your presence in accompanying them to seek help, if you're willing and able, can be very helpful for people to know that, you know, there's someone walking with them through this. And after that, if let's say, you know, you've managed to successfully, you know, uh, attend to someone who uh, has uh, had, suicidal thoughts, you also want to continue to check in. So go back to step number two, continue to check in. You may need to do this a little bit more proactively, which means rather than just saying that, oh, you know, please call me at any time if you are, uh, if you need help, rather you may want to actively check in with them and ask them, how are you doing, you know, um, you know, uh, and, and ask them very often why this is important is because people who are, feeling down or struggling with these things um, may feel very helpless. They may feel that they don't deserve or, or they can't be helped. So they may not actually on their own be proactive in seeking help, which is why it's important actually to, on your part as someone who's supporting them, you may want to be a bit more proactive to check in. Of course, not intrusively, you need to adjust to what the person is uh, comfortable with and, and the, what the, the person feels is helpful for them. 
All right, so do this periodically over time uh, according to um, what is appropriate. Okay, so that's uh, step number three, which is how you respond, how you connect them with help, how you connect to them and connect them with, with additional help. So I want to, and this is where I want to cover a little bit about um, some tips and, and how a general understanding of how mental health care works um, in Singapore. Okay, so sometimes some people actually don't know how services are set up or where to, to get help, what are the available channels to get help. So the first basic level is basically connecting people with counseling services, really um, professionals who are trained uh, to be able to do that listening and maybe giving a little bit of ad general advice uh, process counseling, basic counseling. So the easiest and, and, and uh, most accessible would often be the family service center. So these are centers where there are social workers staffing family service centers who are trained actually to provide basic counseling services. And these are free of charge to people who, who uh, approach them. Okay, so that's basic counseling. But uh, above uh, and beyond that, actually many counseling centers, external counseling centers, uh, if private counseling centers have tiered payment or subsidy schemes. A very good example of this would be Brahm Center's own counseling services, right? That's tiered according to your income, according to your means. So it doesn't necessarily need to be very expensive or very inaccessible. So this would be a good first stop uh, to, to look for help. Of course, later I've covered some of the hotlines as well. Those are, are um, very easily available um, uh, helplines that, that people can call. Uh, this slide is more covering how are service, what kind of service, what other services are available beyond that. Okay. Now, if they need a little bit extra help beyond just uh, simple counseling, um, actually, all polyclinics can make subsidized referrals to psychiatry services. So, um, by all means, go uh, accompany them to a polyclinic. The polyclinic doctors can do some basic assessment. They can do a risk assessment as well, and they will provide advice uh, on what to do next, where to go, and what is available. In fact, um, we are starting to train a lot of our primary health care in the polyclinics, a lot of doctors in basic mental health assessment as well as treatment. So in fact, if it's uh, simple uh, uh, conditions like depression, anxiety, um, the polyclinic doctor will be able to already initiate uh, treatment. Um, uh, some polyclinics actually have some basic limited psychological therapy services. So they have uh, psychologists attached to them as well, and they can start the therapy process um, um, as, a, as a first step. So polyclinics are a good um, first port of call if you need additional help. Of course, if a situation is an emergency, if, if uh, the person has harmed themselves already, you don't really need to contact, uh, if you've managed to calm the person down, uh, actually what you can do sometimes is also to accompany them directly as a walk-in to any emergency department, any uh, A&E, where the doctors there will be able to attend to any physical injury and perform basic risk assessment and management, okay? So general uh, emergency departments, uh, if you walk in, you may not get to see a psychiatrist on the same visit, but they will be able to attend to you and again, perform the basic assessment and management and give you uh, advice. So one thing that maybe, you know, not many people, not everyone is aware of, but actually all public hospitals have general psychiatry and psychology services. So not necessarily you need to go directly to IMH. Actually, all public hospitals already have uh, psychiatry services where you can see a doctor and get the help that you need. If... Um, uh, as a last resort, uh, one thing, one good thing to keep in mind is that if you do need a walk-in uh, urgent kind of psychiatric uh, review or see a psychiatrist on an urgent basis, the IMH emergency, excuse me, the IMH emergency room is the is is a twenty-four hour walk-in service. It's the only uh, twenty-four hour psychiatry walk-in service in Singapore. So this is also open to anyone to to approach if you need urgent urgent kind of help. 
All right, so in this, in, in this last tip, tip number four, I want to stress certain points to people, to lay people uh, who are helping people with uh, mental health conditions. It can be very scary because um, people don't know how to manage, okay, how much should I help? Or what is my responsibility in terms of helping someone who is suicidal? Okay, so essentially, um, as people who are helping others, we need to establish um, healthy boundaries, know where our responsibilities lie. So the first thing to really understand is you are not a mental health professional and your role is really not, you're not aiming to replace a professional, okay? So the idea is you're not there to heal this person or to solve their problems or to stop them from having suicidal thoughts anymore. Uh, you, uh, you know, this process of, uh, of getting better, of recovery, of getting help, you know, is uh, the person themselves that do have to play an active role as well. Uh, the, the, the thing about, you know, mental health recovery is that it's not something people can do passively. They just, you know, take a pill or things like that. But it actually is a process where they need to participate. They need to commit to it and they need to take responsibility for their well-being. So that is a two-way process between them as well as mental health services. It's not reliant on you as a support person uh, on your own. Eh? So again, you do not need to help this person on your own. And also, you should not be bound to keep risk totally confidential. I, I say risk here, I'm very intentional saying the risk alone. Of course, what they share with you, the details and some you know, difficult circumstances, you won't want to tell people. But when, that, when you do identify significant risk, you should not keep it to them yourself. In fact, even in healthcare services, in mental health services, when we detect high risk, uh, it, that is the one situation where we are actually empowered to break confidentiality. We are responsible to tell someone about it or to help this person actually uh, manage the risk. Okay, we need them to go to a bring them to a safe place, for example, transfer them to a safe place, inform uh, and escalate uh, uh, the situation. So, uh, uh, for example, if a polyclinic doctor detects high risk, they will actually tell the, the person or the family member, you have to go to the a and &E, or you have to go to the IMHE room, for example, because when uh, the risk is high, when an act is imminent, the only way that a person can be kept safe is that they are brought to a safe place, right? And they are put in touch with appropriate health, uh, appropriate care. Again, another thing to be uh, uh, aware and cognizant about as a support person to, to someone who may have suicidal thoughts, you do not need to be available at all times of the day or feel obliged to go above and beyond what you are able to offer, really. Because each and every one of us has our own limitations. Even a counsellor also has limitations. Even a psychiatrist also has limitations, right? So we are not at really at the back and call of people who need help. There are available services, for example, emergency and, and you know, hotlines and things like that, that they should tap. They, they need to appropriately tap on, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to help themselves as well. So essentially what I'm saying that, that suicide prevention and helping people with suicidal thoughts is a collective effort. It's, it's an effort that is really spread out among various, various people, various parties that all help to contribute and to support people who, who need help. All right, so having healthy boundaries, knowing your role, um, is, is especially important. Of course, roles uh, vary from person to person. Let's say if you were an immediate family member, you may want to take a lot more active role in helping a person. You may want to accompany them, for example, to their, their appointments. You may want to check up with them more regularly versus if you're an acquaintance, if you're a colleague and things like that, it may not be your role to actually do that. Okay, you, Of course, if they came to you, they, they trust you, then uh, do what you are able, able to do and willing to do, right? But essentially, you need to know to put them in touch with what is appropriate and to establish these boundaries clearly to tell them that, you know, I, would, I appreciate you telling me all this and I want to help you, but 
you know, there's, I, I, I can only do so much, right? And, and beyond that, I actually need help of other people in order to help you. So that's, that's one way that we help people to uh, understand these boundaries and the roles that we play in helping them. So this is my last slide. Uh, it really collects a little bit of the, the more accessible resources. Um, so Samaritans of Singapore SOS uh, is the main helpline that, that is run. Actually, there are a lot of helplines, uh, as you can see below. Uh, this, SOS is not the only one. They've, they've now shortened their helpline number to four, four, four digits, 1767. So that's uh, toll free, easy to dial and, and uh, people can call. Um, they also have extended their helplines to email befriending services. So you can email them, text messaging as well. Um, and on top of that, uh, IMH runs a crisis helpline, which is 24 hour, meant 24 hours. Uh, the Singapore Association of Mental Health also has a helpline that you can call. And if you are Mandarin speaking, I'm sure SOS can, can attend to our Mandarin speaking friends as well, but Care Corner Counseling Center runs a specific Mandarin counseling hotline. So that's the number there. And for children, there is also a, a helpline that they can call. So these are some of the uh, simple helplines. Um, Brown Center, I know also, you know, in the in the slide flash before the talk, they also run their own helpline. There is uh, email, there's text messaging, WhatsApp as well and they run counseling services as well. So do um, uh, make use of that if you do need to. All right, so that concludes um, right on time about